Holly Warner here. Boston Myths, once again. Dun, 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 here I am again. I got all fancy for you folks today. No, I'm kidding, it's a ponytail day and I had a hoodie on because zero you-know-whats are given. It's Friday, so whatever. Um, I wanted to talk to you guys about managing your iron overload with nutrition. It's something that's being talked about in the carnivore community. And of course, as with everything else, as it seems in the carnivore community or on the interwebs in general, everybody is an expert. Everybody's an expert. They're an expert in carnivore. Should you eat only steaks and salt and water? Yes. Or should you eat nose to tail? Yes. Hey, guess what? Do whatever the fuck works for you. I know, rocket science, right? Okay, but seriously though, guys, um, you know, check your labs. Check your labs. If you wanna know how you're doing and how you're reacting, check your labs. If you're not checking your labs, that's a problem because you don't know. You have no idea what's going on. And then you're looking at, oh my gosh, I'm super worried about having too much iron and I'm gonna get sick. That's probably not gonna happen unless you have some sort of genetic predisposition, which a lot of the people that have too much iron and overload of it is because of specific genetic predispositions to having this hereditary condition. It has nothing to do with the fact that you ate liver every day and steak every day. I mean, you'd have to have like a 10 ounce steak every single day. And even then you're still not gonna have an overload. Even if you were having liver every day and like 10 ounces of it, you're still not gonna, chances are, have an overload. I mean, I'm sure there's exceptions to every rule, but in my clinical practice, it's just not something that I see. Testing, if you're gonna test for it, you can test for that around three months if you, if you want to, but I kind of feel like it's a bit of a waste. I like to push patients to the six month mark, because if you're gonna invest money in getting tested, you're gonna get everything tested. Look at your lipid panel, look at your CBC, check out what all of the different enzymes are doing. How's your liver, how's your kidney function, which will be just fine, folks. Just make sure you're hydrated, legit make sure you're hydrated. And that doesn't mean just drinking water, you're going to need to get those electrolytes into your body. So we can talk about that in another video. This one's all about iron. So let's go back to the nitty gritty. Okay, so I've decided to add this up here so you guys can read a little bit. Um, this is the condition of iron overload. There are four different types of this, of hemochromatosis, which is typically hereditary. You will usually have one or more of, there's three common mutations or polymorphisms. You probably have you know, one or more of those. Uh, the HFE gene is responsible for literally 90% of all overloads of iron that are non-transfusal related. So essentially with this genetic, this HFE um, gene, you've got the HFC gene is on a chromosome six, which codes for a protein that actively participates in regulating iron absorption. You with me? So if you're having your genetics done and you are someone who has a propensity to having really elevated iron and they think it may be a hereditary thing, then something to look at is these three genes. You can see the C282Y, the H63D, and the uh, S65C. Now, something that I like to point out with genetics is that your ethnicity is going to play a role. Celtic descent, and I am someone who is of Celtic descent, those of us who have Celtic descent do tend to have a much higher risk for this being hereditary. It's usually passed down from our parents or our grandparents. So it's something to look into. If you are Celtic, you're gonna wanna pay attention to this one, guys. I had a little discussion online with somebody. I say discussion, it was a Google certified rando on the internet, which always kind of makes me laugh because we have these groups uh, typically Facebook groups and people come on board and they're like, I'm an expert. I've been doing carnivore for six months. What? And then we've got idiots like Tolfino who push their bullshit. And I get that he's part of the carnivore movement, but he's not really doing it any justice and constantly attacking people like Sean Baker. Listen, I love nose to tail. I love Dr. Saladino. 
I don't feel like eating steak only is beneficial long term and else you're trying to do some sort of an extreme elimination diet then yeah maybe introduce that phase for a bit and then go back to the the previous phase and then see what you can tolerate and what you can't tolerate i'm a huge fan of nose to tail or supplementing to make it seem like your nose to tail and again my theory a lot of people have been doing steak salt water long term Um, and they're starting to kind of come out of the woodwork, and they're doing just fine. So if you don't have nutritional deficiencies, then go for it. I am totally okay with that. You got to do what works for you. This doesn't need to be dogmatic. It doesn't need to be a cult. Do what works for you. The things that I find in the groups, however, are that people treat it like a cult. They hear somebody make a comment. They disagree with it because they listen to some idiot on YouTube. They come back with a generalized statement and a link gotta love the links from PubMed or WebMD or wherever they Googled, because realistically, that's what they're doing is Googling. And then they come on and they go, hey, look at this. You're not citing research that you understand how to read. Clinical research, looking at deciphering and interpreting this data actually takes training. It takes knowledge. We are taught how to do this in school It isn't something you just Google and understand how to do. So when you're citing a study that you don't really understand, it doesn't work that way. So maybe, and good for you, but maybe kind of take a step back and go, huh, maybe the person who's posting that has the education is trying to help people out might actually have a valid point instead of immediately jumping and attacking. You gotta keep an open mind, folks. So with this being said, I was told that our iron is basically free floating all over the body and like in tissues and here and there and whatever. Now the numbers vary. It depends on the school of thought. Most people say that it's around 70%. Some people have shown that it's about 90%. So it's safe to say that somewhere between the 70 and 90% mark is where our iron is going to be located. That's the big chunk. And that means in your blood. Hemoglobin, it's in your blood, which is why when we do the testing, we test your iron levels, we're taking blood, which is also why if you have too much of an iron load, we tell you to go donate blood. When you donate blood, you're going to take down those iron levels, but you're not going to touch any of the other nutrients. You're not going to lose the copper and the zinc. So you're not going to throw out that delicate copper zinc balance. You're not going to lose the B12. You're not going to lose the magnesium, which is also predominantly found in the tissues. About 10% of magnesium floats around the blood, 90% is in the tissues, which is why for certain nutrients, we do an RBC or a tissue test to get adequate numbers rather than blood, which is serum. There's a difference. You have to know where to look to find the proper numbers. It's very important, folks, if you're looking in the wrong spot. Like if I am checking my tires to see how much gas is in my gas tank, I'm probably not going to get a um, proper (laughs) reading of my gas level. Just saying. Now, I'm not poo-pooing eating only muscle meats. I love a good ribeye and I live most of the time throughout the week on steak, steak, and more steak. Absolutely. I throw in some liver here and there and organ meats or I supplement with it. Absolutely. The thing that I do find is that a lot of my patients who come to me and they go, I'm eating the steak, I'm doing the elimination, but I'm finding I am having histamine issues. Turns out they've got a copper deficiency. So it got to dig a little deeper. Like I said, the delicate copper zinc balance, it's a thing. You got to look into that. These people are typically cutting out certain foods that are going to include the copper and the zinc in them because they were worried about, uh uh-oh, I don't want to be exposed to too much iron. That's kind of a problem. Your copper is going to come from the liver as well as like your vitamin A or B12. You're going to get a lot of nutrients in your liver. Your liver is essentially a superfood. Shellfish, you're going to get, you know, the zinc and copper is a pretty good balance in that. Red meat, you're going to get some zinc. So that's good. However, you're going to get a lot of zinc and not a lot of um, copper, which... I mean, you're not really contributing much to your iron overload with that, like 10%, 20%, something like that, I think the numbers are. But you can contribute to that imbalance of copper and zinc because they need to be balanced, which then leads to a copper deficiency, which leads to 
Histamine symptoms. So if you're suffering from histamine and you're eating an all steak diet, you may want to look into maybe incorporating certain other things, maybe add some liver in there once a week. And you're not going to get an overload if you have liver once a week. You will be fine. If you have a genetic predisposition, it doesn't really fucking matter what you eat. You need to correct it by giving blood. That's how that works. Something else you guys can consider if you want to is something that we call like either chelators or uh, binders. Some people like to add in extra calcium because calcium does reduce some of the absorption of the, um, the iron that we have when we eat. So you can take a calcium supplement. I do recommend a lot of my patients that have higher oxalate levels to have a calcium supplement when they eat because it's gonna bind to the oxalates and it does help with oxalates. So there are some schools of thoughts that like 300 milligrams of calcium with a meal are gonna help with excess iron if you're prone to such as well as bind to the oxalates. So you can do that if you want to. We all know coffee works as a binder as well. Um, what else is there? Phytate is an iron inhibitor. Again, it chelates iron, but that's not something that I typically recommend in my own clinical practice. It's out there for knowledge sake. There you go. Do your research, look it up, check it out if you want to. Other than that, um, yeah, eat your meat. Don't be afraid of an iron overload. If you have a genetic predisposition, then yes, it's a problem and you need to give blood. Having a steak is not going to hurt you. Okay. Okay. Glad we solved that problem. Have a great weekend. If you're watching this after today, then have a good week, have a good day, have a good evening. Whatever the case may be, just have a good one. Oh, and before you go, don't forget to hit like and subscribe. Oh, and you can share it with all your friends if you really enjoyed the content. Okay, that's it. I'm gone. Bye, guys.